During her time as an elder, she has worked to strengthen local churches, support pastors, and to stand in solidarity with and work in Eastern Europe with the LGBTQ communities. Her work as a human rights activist has been instrumental in the fight for LGBTQ rights in the former Soviet occupied world. She sits on the MCC's global justice team, the ecumenical and interfaith team, and is the liaison elder to MCC's disability forum. I am personally grateful to her as she has been my friend, encourager, and mentor as our church journeyed through the small church revitalization initiative. Reverend Elder Fisher is a Canadian living in the United States. She is legally married to her partner, Judy, and has a daughter, Carly, whose fathers are two gay men. Her passion is making a difference in the world. Can you give her a warm welcome? Well, what an honor it is to be here, and uh, what a joy it is to be with you on Mother's Day, and to actually see Charlie, because much of our uh, work was done uh, on Skype before it had these kind of uh, video capabilities that could include more than one person. And I'm so glad to see that you're technologically so advanced. <laughs> Kudos. Um, happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers, and I really will be expecting that gift. Uh, and I was asked especially to bring you greetings from MCC Richmond, who celebrates your 25 years with you. There was a big roar that went up when they heard that I was going to be preaching today at your church, and they're just thrilled uh, for you that you have reached this milestone. I also bring you greetings on behalf of the senior leadership team, and just want to take a moment to, to thank you. Thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness. Thank you for being willing to, to participate in uh, the kinds of things that MCC does to increase uh, awareness, the special offerings, and the educational things that happen. I want to particularly um, thank you for the disaster relief offerings you're working on now. You're going to hear in the not too distant future about some changes in the way we do things within MCC. And one of the things you will hear is that um, I'm now in charge of disaster relief. And I'm not sure if they put me in charge of disaster relief because wherever I seem to go, there seem to be disasters. <laughs> or if it's because I care passionately about being compassionate and this gives us that opportunity. I want to tell you just one small story about disaster relief and what the impact is because we not we don't only just go in where there have been tornadoes or huge disasters like in Haiti um, or it, you know we we actually go into uh, and support pastors in nations where uh, the economic situation is very difficult. One of our pastors in South Africa who pastored our uh, church in Johannesburg, uh, which is an all African, uh, South African church, um, and we, she had a tumor growing on her spine, and she was at risk of losing all her mobility, which would mean that it, it was a death sentence for her. And that disaster relief fund allowed us to pay for her surgery and to get her physiotherapy so she could walk again. So that kind of thing has a profound impact. We've had a profound impact in Haiti, just being able to send medical supplies and to support people that didn't have that support. So disaster relief, you change the world when you change that when you add to that, when we're able to step in and help. So I thank you for that. And then I really want to just tell you how blessed you are 
to have Charlie as your pastor. I have had just a joyous time working with him and find him to be a caring, strong, committed uh, man of great integrity. And I believe the work he has done in Waco and with the university or college there uh, to be really transformational in people's lives. So I think that you need to give your pastor a great deal. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks today and every day for bringing us to you, for standing with us even when it feels that no one else is. We give you thanks for the work of this church and the ministry in Waco. We give you thanks for the ministry of each person in the pew. We give you thanks for the ministry of Charlie and ask you to bless them and rain down upon them all of the things that they most desperately want. Fill their hearts with those things. And God, I ask you to bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts that they might be acceptable in your sight. Now and forever. Amen. I love the themes you've chosen for your worship. I really think that they're fabulous. One love many faces, and then a house of prayer for all people. Can people hear me all right, Charlie? Yes. Okay, I just see you chattering, aren't okay. <laughs> I was making sure the camera could hear you. Oh, okay, good. Just wanted to make sure, okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is my first uh, preaching. I've done Bible studies internationally this way, but my first preaching attempt this way and I'm used to wandering around. So if you see me dip off the screen, it's because I'm trying to wander in my chair. And so uh, please be patient with me. But I love uh, this theme of one love, many faces, a house of prayer for all people this week. And I love this passage in Isaiah because I think it really talks to us to us, to our hearts about who we are and where we fit in all of this. When people talk to us about whether we're welcome, whether we're accepted, whether we should be a part of Christendom or a part of a faith community, I think this passage addresses that. It talks about acceptance if we come to the table. God accepts the eunuchs if they come to the altar. Accept the foreigners, and I think that we have lived our lives as foreigners. Do we then also extend that welcome? Do we extend that welcome to foreigners? Do we reach out our hand to those who aren't of us, our community, who don't look like us or act like us? They could be slightly older lesbians who wear purple jackets and funny collars. Do we open the door to them? Do we open the door to those young people who talk in funny words like, when you get a text message from them and you wonder, what in heaven's name is that? Filled up and ready to burst. <laughs> that that's what church is about, that we come into a sanctuary, we sit down, and we become filled with the Holy Spirit until we're ready to burst. We're filled up and ready to burst. And I believe that God says, and that table, that place of filling is for us, that we are called forward, and we are the ones that are meant to take that out. Too often, we focus on ourselves in our seats, in the pews, and we don't take our message out beyond our front door for whatever reason. Sometimes we're afraid that people might judge us or that people might arrest us and put us in jail and interrogate us, which they do sometimes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. But what's most important 
is can we take the good news out? Can we bring a message of hope to the world? Can we stand with those who are marginalized and oppressed? Can we become a part of a solution as opposed to being seen as other? I believe this passage in Isaiah calls us calls to us and says, you are not only accepted, but you are expected to move forward and to go out. That we too are people of Christ. We are people of God's. So part of it becomes, when are we uncomfortable? When do we think enough, I'm not gonna do this anymore. When are we called to stop? Can you imagine if people 20 years ago had decided, you know, this is uncomfortable. We don't want to do church in Waco, Texas. I can't imagine that Waco, Texas is the easiest place in the world to do church. I don't hear of it as a bed of liberalism. <laughs> Amen. You know, I come from Canada. We're pretty liberal there. But here in Waco, can you imagine if 25 years ago, people had decided, no, we're not going to risk it. It's too risky. We're not going to bring a word of hope. Can you imagine what a different community it would be? And here you are, 25 years, a quarter of a century later, still there and active and growing and participating in changing lives. You're now reaching out to young people and I have a passion for reaching our youth. I believe that that's where we need to be. We just need to do it different. We think that we need to fit into church that looks this way. Nice pews, all in a line, all sitting with our legs crossed and listening to a sermon from a pastor wearing a purple jacket and a nice collar up at the front. But no, we do not. We need to be where people are. We need to encounter them where they are. And I think that that was something that we heard in Peter's call. Because he's called to now look at taking the word to people that he had always been told weren't there, weren't part of Christendom, weren't part of who God had called specifically in the Jewish community. And he's being called to take a message, take this message to foreigners. He's not being called to sit and wait in your pew for the foreigners to come to you nicely, and when they come, be nice to them. He is told, go out. All of the things that happened with Christ were about going out. We were meant to go out and change the world. And that ministry with young people, that going out to colleges is going out and changing the world. We need to encounter young people where they are. We need to encounter LGBTIQFXY people out where they are. We need to be there. We need to not have to say no. You heard a little bit about some of the work I've done. When I became an elder, we had changed and restructured, and I was given an area loosely titled Eastern Europe, and it covered a whole lot of countries that I'd never heard of. It included countries that weren't even technically Eastern Europe, but there were countries that I didn't know a thing about. One of those countries was Moldova. How many of you know where Moldova is? One person, two people, three. Okay, we're getting there. So how many of you know where Ukraine is? Okay, how many of you know where Romania is? Okay, well the Ukraine sort of folds over the top of Romania and then there's this little space right in about here, right here. That's Moldova. It is the poorest country in Eastern Europe. Economically, it has only one thing. It grows wine. 
the largest where they bring in the largest amount of money to the country is from young people working outside of the country sending money home it is a country that was the only country that had an elected communist party in eastern europe and that communist party really didn't have any control anyways because the police controlled the state we were invited to go there and worship with people and talk to them about what it meant to be an lgbt IQ person of faith may have invited us. And the first time I went through the airport there to get into the country, it was one where there was a lot of guns and a lot of frisking and looking at you up and down and trying to figure out why you were there. So I went and I met people who met in dark rooms and I had been in the area and met with people in another country about a year before that. And the group that had brought me in Moldova had written an article about me. And that article was in the gay, on the gay website for Moldova. A young man had read that and he lived in the countryside. And he got his very best clothes on and he walked for about 20 kilometers until he caught a ride in the back of a horse-drawn hay cart and then he was he was driven another 20 kilometers that's like a mile but not quite and he was driven that far then he got out and he walked 60 kilometers into Chisinau, Moldova because he wanted to meet somebody who was gay and Christian and a pastor and he had heard I was coming and he had read that article and he came because he wanted to be told that God loved him well I've been going there to Moldova for a number of years and we have been trying to have a march and it's always been turned down and then we finally finally got permission from the European court they said that they had to let us march and so we got a certificate that said we could march and that we could be there so I went and we held a worship service I should have realized something was wrong when the police attended the worship service and they said what are you doing here and we said oh it's a workshop but even in that workshop they had decorated with a thousand cranes for peace and for hope the women had gotten them together and they had made a huge MCC sign that said that MCC was welcome in Kishina. So we met and then we were celebrating the opening and we got a note from the mayor saying, no, we can't march. Well, we didn't quite know what to do, but that because of the European Union, the European Union had said, you know, you can, can gather they have to have freedom of assembly. And so 50 people are allowed to gather at any one time without harm. So we chose 40 people and we got on a bus to go anyways. We had notified our embassies and when I notified the Canadian embassy, the council said, I don't think you should do this. But then she said, I think you need to talk to the head of our organization in Bucharest, the ambassador. So I did. And the ambassador said, Diane, if you don't do it, who will? I'll come and get you out. So I went knowing that my ambassador knew who that I was there, even though he wasn't in that country. I knew that I could march. So I went with them, and all we were marching for was tolerance. 
people had made signs and they had them on the bus. God loves everyone. I'm your neighbor, love your neighbor. Would Jesus discriminate? Well, we got there and there was nobody there. We thought this looks great. And so then we were getting things onto the bus, getting ready to leave and I heard this noise. And I looked out of the window at the back of the bus and I saw a throng of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people running at the bus. They had been out front. The police told them where we were and they ran carrying icons and Bibles. And they shook them at us, told us, who are you? What are you doing here? Be gone. And they started to rock the bus back and forth and back and forth. And then somebody got into the engine of the bus and unhooked it so we couldn't get away. I told the driver, they've unhooked the engine. He went out to stop them and they beat him up. Then they tried to set the engine of the bus on fire. They were back there with their lighters. There was Orthodox priests at the windows banging on it, banging on it, holding always the Bible as though this was a weapon. Finally, two religious leaders got onto the bus and we said, what can we do to get these young people safely away from here? And they said, pass us all your signs. And so hand, over hand, over hand, we handed them forward and we gave them the signs. And the, they gathered up those signs and they threw them off the bus and the crowd fell on them like dogs that hadn't been fed for a long time. And they ripped them and ripped them and ripped them and cheered as though they were at the trophies of war. The bus driver was allowed to rehook the engine up and they drove us back to the place we had begun. When we got there, we got a call saying they're on their way. They're going to burn the building. We sent all the young people away and we all went and got in a van I had driven from uh, Bucharest. Now, it wasn't one of my brighter moves. It was a rainbow colored van. So. <laughs> So I know now, don't drive rainbow colored vans. So we all went to a hotel that was safe and they asked me if I would move my van. Up until that point, people had, the police had not intervened. We had called on the bus and we had phoned and we had screamed, we had called our embassies trying to get the police to respond. But it was the police that were sending everybody everywhere. So I went out with Flora and my colleague and we moved the rainbow van. And we took it out and as we drove out of the parking lot, the police were there and two cars of protesters drove up and started to rock our van and started to hit it. And I just inched forward and drove forward and turned a corner. And when I turned a corner, all of a sudden, three police cars descended on us the chief of police, the chief of the detectives, and the secret service. I was taken to the Moldova jail. I was interrogated because apparently I had held an illegal worship service. They had gone to the hotel where we were staying and told them that we were criminals. They would not give me a translator they interrogated me in Russian. They finally agreed to interrogate me in Romanian. Now, I have safety. I was a Canadian. I'm the head of the church in Canada. I was a fairly visible religious leader. And Amnesty International had been contacted and told that I would be there doing this march. 
And so lawyers from Amnesty International came and got me out of jail. And I was sent on my way and told I had to be back on Monday. And so as we left, the secret police began following us. And I had arranged to do a worship service that night in the hotel. I didn't know if we should cancel it. But I decided to go ahead. Now, when you get picked up by the secret police in Moldova, you disappear. And you're not seen again. They have absolute power. So we went back and they stationed two police of the secret police outside the doors. They questioned everybody that entered, trying to stop people from coming to anything I might do. Twelve young people went through that and came anyways because they wanted to hear that God loved them. They sat around and listened to the stories of Jesus for them. Do we accept foreigners and who's foreign? Those young people had more courage and were willing to die for their faith. They put their lives on the line for their faith. I was so humbled. So we have to meet people where they are and they will be there. And we have to be ready to be out there where they are. And in Waco, you need to be ready to be out there where they are. You need to take a message of hope to people who haven't heard it. You need to reach out to young people that might be being bullied. You need to be there on the front lines saying God loves you. It doesn't matter who you are, God loves you. So do we accept the foreigner? I believe that that's your call. I believe that that is what you're doing. I believe that's what you've been doing for 25 years and I want to see you doing it for another 25. And I want Charlie to be your pastor that long. <laughs> You are going to do amazing things. So accept the foreigner. Stand with the foreigner and know that you too are a foreigner. Think of our eunuchs as our trans community. Think of all those sheep in that sheet. Think of all those animals in that sheet lowered down from heaven as all the LGBT people looking for hope. So happy anniversary. Celebrate with glee and with gusto and reach out. Reach out to the foreigner. You are the voice of hope in Jesus name. Amen.